Hey, and welcome to The Fi, guys. Today we are so excited to bring on an interview, our first guest Our today. first guest. Our first today guest. Today. <laughs> so today we have Hugh Massey, the executive chairman and founder of DNA Behavioral International, a behavior and money insights company. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. He was often referenced as a reformed accountant. I love that. Mm -hmm. A little bit of comedy in there. Uh, money energy pioneer, high stakes decision orienter, a serial entrepreneur, boys without father mentor, and award winning author, and a great dad. And a great dad. That, that's, that's what I would that's say. Important. Is, that's the most important thing. I like that. However, Hugh is most known as a behavioral solutions architect who self empowers people globally with increased behavioral and money consciousness for unlocking exponential growth, which has led to over 2 million individuals to experience reduced stress, greater happiness, more success, and most importantly, better health for longer. I love so, it. So please join us today with our interview with Hugh Massey. All right, we're good to go. All right, All so, right. Hugh, you... so yeah, just something about my life that's uh, interesting, I suppose we can always go back to, to the start. So. <laughs> Uh, something I talk about a lot with people is that I was a boy without a father. So my father died when I was one. Uh, yes. So that, I suppose that, and, you know, that has its own interesting journey growing up, the, the you know, the issues that uh, that come along with that, which is something I've learned a lot about actually in the last few years, because I found quite a, quite a lot of our clients at DNA Behaviour were in the same situation and, and faced the same issues, which actually led to us guys um, setting up a charity called Boys Without Fathers, uh, which which is there. So that's something that's perhaps uh, a little less known about me, uh, but otherwise background wise, you, know, you can tell from my accent, I'm not from California. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm from Southwest of there in, in Sydney, Australia. Uh, really? I, wow. I, as a sports, I love cricket, uh, which is a, very English type game and then tennis and golf. Yes. And uh, I was a CPA once upon a time, ran a family office, and now I have DNA behavior as my main gig, uh, which has sort of been the case for about 20 years now. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I noticed that you said, or in your bio, that you said that you're a reformed CPA. So what is it that made you want to switch from being a CPA to now you know, running, running your new company? Yeah, so you know, it's a, it's it's a very interesting question, you know, and and having started out, you know, my career uh, as an accountant, and then and then you know, really in in providing financial advice, I was always about the numbers, but but somewhat secretly and a little bit under the covers on the side, I was always looking at people and trying to understand and understand people, and I came to realize that. You know, when I was delivering tax advice or a financial plan, you can't just provide that the same way to every person. You get different reactions from the same information, from the same document, from the same set of facts. So I realized that I had to I had to customize the experience for each person. Mm -hmm. And and when people are also when people are under pressure, they react differently to different things. And and, and I realized, OK, this is not. Uh, uh, well, it, I was going to say this is not normal, but it is normal. This is just people. And I needed mm -hmm. to understand what that is. Mm -hmm. So I brought in a psychologist to to the business and she helped unravel it for me. And I realized that what this was, was people's hardwired behavior. Yeah. And I thought, okay, if I'm going to be successful in life and business, I need to be able to understand people and how they're different be able to provide them with a different, you know, a, a different experience or a unique experience for them. And so that took me down that path. And I suppose some people might say, well, dealing with human behavior is all soft and woo-woo. Mm -hmm. It's not really. It's quite, it's it's hard. And it's the it's a brutal facts of life that whatever we're doing, we're dealing with people. And you've Absolutely. got to understand people for who they are. So that's what puts put me on this path. And I, what I realized is I was a lot more passionate about it. So when somebody asked me one day, Hugh, what are you really passionate about? I said, well, I want to help people all over the world become financially self-empowered. And I knew that was not preparing accounts for them or helping them with tax or <laughs> yeah. choosing the right investments. This was te te teaching them about them. Wow. Yeah, that sounds complex. I know that we talk a lot about psychology on our podcast 
And but for for someone who's actually built a business around it to help yeah. people and understand them, that's that's a whole nother level. Yeah, as a practicing financial advisor, the thing that I found is a lot of people they come to you wanting to know the specific knowledge, the, the dollars and the cents. But at the end of the day, as an advisor, I can go down and I can give them exactly what they need to do. But like you just said there, Hugh, even if you give them the right answer, it doesn't mean they're going to follow through with it because you still need to work on their mindset. You still need to fix them. And for me, what I call that with my with my firm is called money memes. And I don't mean a meme by something that you, you know, a funny little gift that you see on, on the laptop, but something exactly like you say, is that what you mean by like money energy by something that is like a script that is running in someone's head? Yeah, I mean, money energy is very much in the head. And I think, you know, money can be looked at from a number of uh, ways, you know, money is a currency, mm -hmm. but money is also behavior. You know, in, inside our brains, we're all wired a certain way. We've got a life perspective that comes from, in part, our genetics, our very early life, and then life experiences. But then money is also what you think money is. You know, and we all make up stories in our head about money, and we make up stories about what other th people are thinking about money, and 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 that creates. Uh, a money energy in it in its own right, and, and that's something that we all have to deal with. And, and in a way, money is something that's omnipresent in our lives. Whatever we're doing, twenty four by seven, believe me, it is working in your brain while you're asleep. Yes, right? yeah, absolutely. And, and absolutely. so, you know, the concept of money never sleeps. I used to joke, well, that's just earn enough, save enough, and put some in the bank and let it earn mm -hmm. while you're asleep. Yeah. But it's actually what you're thinking about. And it's, so it's the energy that you're putting in a way into your mind uh, about money. And, and, and a lot of that is in the subconscious too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I so think a that's, lot of... uh, uh, you know, it's good that you bring up that question. So, you know, it's a very big topic. Uh, it's very psychological, but financial planning, as you guys have worked out, uh, is extremely psychological. And mm -hmm. yeah. We can take it that someone's got, you know, a million dollars or half a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, and this is what their goal and objectives are, and you can knock out a plan in two minutes. Um, yep. But is that really fit, fitting their life? What's going to happen in their life? Uh, the types of career they're going to have, the life events that they're potentially a, a before them, or their family circumstances? No. Um, yeah. And we're all different, you know, and we all look at money very differently. Um, you know, I look at it differently to my brother. I look at it differently <laughs> to, to others. And it does come down a lot to your personality. So with your work, I'm kind of curious when just when researching about people and their behaviors and how it revolves around money and whatnot, do you find that like there's like a, there's an unlimited possibility of people and their actions, or is it like certain, you know, I know for Chris and I, we have different backgrounds, but we have similar thoughts on money. So is it, how does that, how does that come into play? So, so, you know, we've built a psychometric system that's, you know, very science based. And as far as we've measured so far, there are 4 trillion combinations. Okay. You okay. Know, so, we won't so there are, them then. Gotcha. you know, there's seven million, there's seven, there's seven trillion people on the, or seven billion people on the, on the, on the, uh, on, on the planet. So there are more combinations of people than than there are on the planet. People. And and yeah. and so it is. Okay, some of it will be very, a very minute difference, but essentially everybody is different and. Yeah, you can't just say, you know, you guys are, well, I don't know how old you are. I don't have to know that. But let's say you're, you know, thir in your 30s and you both live in California and, you and you're running a wealth management practice. That doesn't mean you're the same. Um, or that you're two brothers that come from the same family with the same opportunities, same money, inheritance or life opportunities. Doesn't mean you're the same. Um, we're, we're, we're all different. We've got some different perspectives in there. Different life events have hit us at different times uh, that, that make you different too. Yeah. So what I, what I notice a lot is it seems like the biggest thing that you've been trying to help people with is trying to manage those, those invisible scripts they have in their mind, the things that they've learned that maybe grandma said at the dinner table and they've just absorbed that to be reality. But maybe at some point I'd like to 
I liken it to stepping outside of the matrix and you're seeing that maybe the world you've constructed around yourself is not the real world and you can begin to step outside of it. So how does one begin to start to master their money energy if they realize that it's not working for them? Yeah, I think the 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 first thing is so you bring you bring up a number of interesting points. I think the first thing is is that what we do is we want people to understand what their natural strengths are and their natural struggles and to learn to work with to learn to work with the strengths and to manage the struggles. We don't like to say people have got weaknesses, but we like to get people working in that zone and get and, and, and getting flow in their life. Now, the reality also what can come with that is some false beliefs. Yeah. And uh, you know, everyone puts up a wall around themselves and thinks, well, I can't do this or I should be doing this because my parents or grandparents said I should be doing that. You know, that that part comes second of trying to strip away some of that. Uh, and take away the self-limiting beliefs mm -hmm. uh, is 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 a key part. If you're going to grow your wealth, I mean, not everybody probably is going to become a billionaire, but there's no reason why you can't. And I'm not going to say people can't, but you've got to strip away some self self-limiting beliefs uh, mm -hmm. to do that. And you know, life is a constant growth journey. But I think doing that from within a higher level of self-awareness and consciousness. Is what we're is what we're really encouraging, and then there are life strategies that come after that to give yourself the maximum opportunity. Because, you know, if you are going to create more wealth in your life, you're probably going to have to make a quantum leap somewhere. You know, it doesn't just happen Definitely. in a linear fashion. Yeah, and you've got to have a very open mind for that because things don't always happen in the way that you expect them to like you know mm -hmm. often yep. meeting a life partner doesn't just happen with the type of person you thought you would meet or when and where um, it's the same with career opportunities you know we get opportunities that come to us from left field a little bit you meet somebody there's something going on are you prepared to make that jump uh i move countries you know in a, in a way to do this human behavior work from sydney australia to america that's a quantum mm -hmm. leap yeah, uh, definitely. You've, but you've got to know enough about yourself and does it feel right and can you emotionally cope with it? Have you got the behavior to cope with it or the temperament? You've got to know all those things. And so the more you know about that and the more you're prepared, you're energetically in the right place, the more things you can draw into your life. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But if so you sit you... there negatively stressed about money yeah, and and you're just counting every cent and and looking at it in very linear sort of uh, uh, poverty mindset, nothing's going to happen. Yeah, no, we agree. Yeah, we talk about a lot a lot on the podcast of how generational curses and generational you know successes you know they can happen and they get passed down. But how do you find to really peel back the layers on oneself? Like, how can do you have any tips for us that uh, you know simple maybe day to day tips or you know life tips? to start changing your mindset to not be so, you know, I don't want to say poverty driven, but like to, to be stuck in your own self. I, what, what I'm, I, what I'm guessing is at some point it's these little compounding growth, growth, growth. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, all those little things add up to become that quantum leap that you spoke about, but to get to that quantum leap could take generations a year. I don't know how long that it, might it, take on it, average. You don't know when the quantum leap's going to come. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's part of probably the magic of life. Like you, no one knows when they're going to meet their soulmate or their life mate, or you're going to meet a fantastic business partner who's going to turn up tomorrow. You don't know that. That's um, that's part of the mystery of life. Yeah. But I think the the thing is is to is to is the more that you know yourself and you go out there and play your game, not what someone else is expecting the more chance that you have of that happening. Um, the more that you stress yourself about things, the worse off you'll be. The more you do things that you're not passionate about or don't believe in, that's a problem. I think who you hang out with and build relationships with is very important. I think that's one of the key things that to, you know, in terms of making quantum leaps, a lot of opportunities in life comes through people. Yeah. So looking at your network and who who you mix with is important whether that's socially 
uh, you know, sports, uh, and then in business. Uh, you know, that, 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 that again is important because, you know, in a way we're only one or two phone calls or one or two meetings away potentially from, uh, you know, success. Now, I suppose some people out there are extroverted and they're meeting lots of different people and others out there, I'm more one of these ones who's introverted. I probably don't meet as many people, but it might be a little bit more targeted. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, in, 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 in who I, fo you know, who I focus on meeting, but you're not going to meet people by sitting at home either. And yeah, no. so I think that's a big one. I think it's doing work that you're passionate about. It's having a very clear purpose, uh, for what you're going to do, you know, okay, you guys are in wealth management, but perhaps you've got a bigger purpose in that and wealth management is just a tool or, a, mm -hmm. or, a, a, a you know, sort of part of the railway tracks to getting to a bigger place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But you've got to, you've got, I think you've got to have that, you've got to have some of that purpose and then you've got to have uh, some kind of moonshot goal. I think that's something that's really important. And you'll go through lots of iterations of that. When you're younger, things change. And, and uh, you know, it's something I talk a lot about with people is their identity. And what's the identity that you want to have? How do you want to be remembered? Your legacy in life? Uh, who are you going to hold yourself accountable to being as a person? And when you elevate yourself that way, then it's amazing how it starts to change some of the decisions you make. Yeah, I, yeah. I can remember a long time ago, one of the biggest exercises I ever did uh, to kind of mold my life into taking control of it was write your own obituary. And I got yeah. to write out exactly what is it that I see myself. And then I got to work backwards. And I realized that a lot of things I was working towards, money, um, notoriety, people knowing my name. I, when I wrote my obituary, guess what? None of those things were on that obituary in any way, shape or form. Yeah. So, and, and I think there's nothing wrong with money being in the equation. I think, you know, I don't want to say it, it shouldn't be, but if you're going to measure your life by how much you have in the bank account, it will become pretty miserable because mm -hmm. there's always going to be somebody who's got more. Yep, yep. Um, and, you know, you don't know there's the day when you suddenly lose it all, right? Or a big subst subst a substantial amount of it because you got sued or you lost money in a business deal or you got divorced or whatever, or you got a sick child, whatever happens. Yeah. Money goes up and down in your life, but does your value to yourself, to the world, the impact you're having change? No. Yeah, I think, and I think that if you can, if you can sort of craft an identity and then define your success, that's more perhaps human impact driven. Definitely. Then, you, then, then you're going to find you're going to be a lot happier and you're possibly going to make a whole lot more money. And then it's mm -hmm. just a matter in its own right. And then look at, okay, well, I want to, you know, you can say, well, I want to impact a million people. Well, maybe you make it a billion people. But if you only get a tenth of the way there, you've already done really well anyway, haven't you? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, I think you, you always set big goals. You, you craft an identity that can allow you to do big things, but it's authentic to you. And you allow, you know, you just go out, you, you've just got to go out there, work hard, but, but be smart about it. And look, you could, you could have enormous success like Mark Zuckerberg or someone like that when, when, or others when you're 30 years old and for others it might happen when you're 70. Mm -hmm. In so between like what, there, enjoy the journey. So what would be like a first step to crafting that vision? Well, I, 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 I mean, the way I approach it with people is that, the first thing is, is to know who you are, what your core behaviours are, what your core talents are, because it is, be, it is behaviourally driven. And that is also energetically where you're going to have the most flow. So you've got to look at what are my talents? What can I do well? Then the second part is what am I passionate about? And the intersection of your talents and your passion will be that unique X factor. Mm -hmm. And that X factor for you will be, what could you be the greatest in the world at, right? Yeah. And 
that that might still require growth and learning and whatnot, but you can be the best in the world at doing that. Mm -hmm. Like for me, it's around building technology systems that integrate behavioral finance and helping people build, you know, uh, solutions for their business around that. I'm very good at that, right? Uh, there aren't too many others that do it very, you know, that can do that. I continue to learn and grow, but that is where my success factor sits. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I'm passionate about it. I mean, and, and everything I've done in my life has built me to being able to do that. And I think that's, when you can figure that bit out, then you can tie your identity to that. And then things like values just fall into place. I mean, that values are important because they're the standards at which you're going to live by and are non you know are the non-negotiables but they don't totally define who you are yeah you know it's it's it is about what you can do and what your being is so they're the steps that you can take to to start building on it and you know it's not a bad exercise just to write down all the things about yourself from, you know, say zero to 18 or zero to the time you got to college, what are all the skills I got, activities I did. In a way, that's when you're younger, how people are going to see you anyway. And then the next phase of your life, say between 22 and 40, what are the things that you've been doing good at, feel more comfortable with? And you're going to see, you're going to see a pattern and a picture start to come out around this. And that's when you can really make, then make this accelerate. So once someone has uncovered their passions, they've uncovered their talents and they found that intersection there. What if they say, but this doesn't bring in money and I still need to be able to live my day to day. Would you preface someone to burn the boats and just move forward with your passions? Or is it more of a, you know, continue to do what you're doing, even if you don't love it and then pursue it on the side and maybe that'll become a bigger thing. That's what I've always said to people. You know, I've seen, for example, people out there doing business consulting work, training, whatever it is, not in love with it, but they love music and they're wonderful at playing the piano. But they're not good enough, perhaps, to be, uh, you know, in a symphony orchestra or, or make life out as a musician. But guess what? You can bake that into your consulting program. And I remember I said that to, to a woman about 20 years ago when we went through this exercise and had this conversation. And then what I saw her doing about six months later was that every event that she ran, she played the piano. Oh, okay. That's creative. I like that. And that made, the, that made what she did more unique and people want to be part of it. Yeah, absolutely. So... You know, yeah, not everybody can be an artist and make millions of dollars or, 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 or make, uh, uh, make enough to pay, the bill, to pay their bills. But, but you, can ne you can never abandon the passion. You just got to work out how to integrate it to your whole life. And I think that's really what you're saying. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. That's, and, and you never know what is going to unpack itself later on. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's... Uh, uh, you know, again, is part of the mystery of life, but I would never let someone abandon their passion. But I would say there's a point of being rational and saying, okay, you're not going to be, uh, uh, you know, make the most money out of this. Mm -hmm. But there's lots of other ways to, to, uh, to deal with that. I've got, a, I've got a 13 year old child and she loves art. Mm -hmm. Am I going to deny her the opportunity to be involved in art? whether she's a great artist in itself of doing paintings and pottery? No, but I could get her into an environment where it is an art-based environment. She loves it or can do something she loves. And I think there's just being creative about it, in your thinking about it and working out those solutions. Yeah, I was, I was recently reading a Wall Street Journal article um, that just came out that was showing that many people are leaving their higher paying jobs and taking lower paying jobs in order to pursue their passions and when you think about that, we, we all think of wealth as this quantifiable thing because it is it is easy. You can say, I'm making this much more money than Dominic, and yeah. he's making this much more money than you, or he's making this much more money. And one thing that I always like to preface our audience to ensure is 
don't only focus on the quantifiable metrics when there are unquantifiable metrics. How good is your relationship with your spouse, with your children? Because um, there are different measures of wealth. Can, can you talk about yeah. like different ways to look at what wealth could mean to somebody? Yeah, there. I, I think you're totally on the right track. It's about the 360 of life, and you know, you've also got to you've also got to bake your health into it. Something that I've become very big around with the money energy work because it's not it's not just the money and the energy of money itself, but it's what the energy of money does to your health, um, to your alcohol consumption, to your eating. They're all wrapped up together, mm -hmm. and you can't separate any part of it and yeah i think it's sometimes it's better to take less money and have a better relationship with your spouse with your children do activities you love be healthy and you don't know what opportunities will come down the the pipeline and mm -hmm. i think the other part is that we're 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 moving into a world now where it's okay to be in the gig economy more more or less and you know, to Definitely. do projects, to to be hired for short term retainers and things like that. I think the when I when I was twenty years old leaving university or college in Australia, it was like, okay, you've got to put on a suit and go and get a job in an accounting firm mm -hmm. because everybody's doing that. I don't think and that's what was expected. Go and get a profession. I don't think it's the same these days. And I don't think those same number of opportunities will be there. Um, certainly work on getting a skill. Right yeah. and have skills that are valuable, but then balance the life out. I think that's you know the 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 advice you're giving your clients. I think spot on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As we continue to talk more about money, one thing that I found very interesting and I would like you to elaborate on. Could you talk to me more about the three dimensions of money that you speak about in in your books and in your company? Yeah. So money is so the three dimensions being money is a currency. That's what we exchange. Um, you know, day in, day out to, to buy things and sell things and earn and give. But then there's your behavior. So the second dimension is just your behavior. How do you um, approach making those decisions? Are you, a, do you think of money? Okay, money is something I've got to save. I've got to hoard. Uh, I've got to ensure I have enough for retirement. You've got that kind of attitude to it. Or no, money is something I invest and I need to put it into things that are going to grow and it's going to help me build an empire even? Uh, or is money about lifestyle and it's about having fun, going out there and traveling, giving to other people? Or it's for my family, you know, and, and educating my kids. You know, people have different perspectives or a different mix of those perspectives mm -hmm. uh, with it. And then money is somewhat what's in your energy fields and what you think it is, what you think the issues relating to it are. And, and uh, you know, people can have good attitudes about money. Others have negative attitudes. You know, that, that shows up, can show up in a marriage. It could show up, gee, I've got a child that's got A, B, C, D circumstances. What do I do with that? Um, or your relationship with your business partner could be good or bad and money is tied up in that, you know, because some of those perspectives have flowed over into it. But what it's doing is it's getting into your energy system where you are thinking about it day in, day out. It's 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 going it's going to sleep with you. You're waking up with thoughts about money. And if you if you go to sleep with thoughts about money and then you wake up doing certain things, you've just manifested that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the energy. And you know, I I, I I hate to say it, there's a lot of people out there that get cancers, particularly in the stomach. That's, I think a lot of it's caused by stress and I think you'll find money is not far away from it. You know, there's plenty of research studies out there showing now that, um, you know, 75% or more of Americans are worrying about money. Mm -hmm. And when you get stress, you store that up in your body, particularly in the lower stomach area. Yeah causes inflammation of the organs, then you start eating badly and bang. You know, you've just, you've brought probably your worst fears in terms of your health to life. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I know it's it sort of sounds a bit coarse the way I put it across, but that's there. Um, and, and the role of your heart, people don't realize how powerful your heart is um, to your being. It's more powerful than your mind or your brain. 
right? It's 60 times more powerful. There's a lot of research about that. So, you know, learning to have a good attitude about money, having a good attitude about other people is important. That doesn't mean you have to go and um, make friends with every human being that's out there and give it all away to everybody. But I think you know where I'm going energetically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Got to have a good attitude, and and comes with that is how you deal with money. So but one you thing can make I... money a restriction in your life, and you can make it something that works for you. And it's not yeah. just working for you in terms of it being invested in the right stocks and bonds, but correct in how you live, yep. and then and then how you grow. Absolutely, yeah. So something that I find a lot is it's very difficult to get someone to change when it is an unconscious behavior, which everything that you just described there, Hugh, sounds like it's unconscious. So how do we get people to realize that there even is a problem there? Um, you know, when you're talking about the, the pains in your, in your gut, I, I practice Buddhism and, and Stoicism. So I'm, I like to think about myself and the nice thing that makes us human is that we have awareness. We have meta awareness. We can actually think about our thinking. Yeah. So, so you're, you're, you're very well advanced. <laughs> um, where most people are not and the fact that you know you guys are younger than I am and you're already on to this is fantastic and I think it is about understanding some of life's philosophy it's understanding the energetic flows how powerful uh, your heart is how powerful the seven chakras are uh, the energy flows from um you know your, your your lower gut right up through up to your up to your brain and then past your brain mm -hmm. and understanding those and, and 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 I think you know what I would say to people is simple terms if you're feeling tired a lot there's probably some negative energies okay and getting so, so in a way to deal with this is you've got to learn to feel it and and you know one way is to do meditations and, and and keep yourself clear, uh, exercise, quiet time. But when you're making a big decision, think about how how you know there's sort of uh, a somatic language you know out there that people talk more about these days. Think about how does that feel in my body? What's my mental condition when I'm making that decision? What's it like afterwards? And and you know learning from that. Yeah, the numbers on the page can say one thing. But they not may, may not be really the reality of the decision. Yeah. Um, now I, I would always say I you know do talk a lot about intuition that your intuition can be very strong if you are extremely attuned, but it can also get in the way too, and and it can be less than accurate. You know we've got a lot of science out there now that says twenty percent twenty eight percent accurate. Mm -hmm. So so I would say to people, you still got to go and look at data. Go and get opinions from other people. Go to your financial advisor, your life support system. But wrap, once you've done all of that, wrap it up with how do you feel about it? You know, is it going to make you comfortable? Because if you make a decision and then you're stressed afterwards, that's the worst place you can be. Mm -hmm. And the more you know yourself and, and, and it's alignment to your overall life, probably the less stressful it's going to be. Yeah. You know, that, that you just brought up an amazing point. My, my wife is, we, we do something called win of the week every week where we talk about, you know, what our biggest thing that we did this week was. And last week, my wife actually turned down a job because, you know, everything for the job was financially the right decision. But in her gut, she knew that she'd be taking on more responsibility, more time away from the house, from the kids, all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the biggest ones that helped that is that she has both Dominic and I in her life to be able to have these conversations with somebody and be able to feel that, have be able to feel everything. But I know with money, it's very hard to even have conversations around those things because there's so much muck built up in people's minds. So what is there a way to make money conversations less difficult or, or what can we do to improve them in our day-to-day -day lives? Well, that's a really good question. And I think first thing I want to do is acknowledge you and your wife for being able to go through that conversation and for her particularly to admit okay, I could make more money, but I'm going to be out of the house more, stress more. It's going to have a flow on impact on the kids. That's a huge thing to admit mm -hmm. because people have so much ego wrapped up in how much they're earning in a job and, you know, all of those types of things. Or we could use the extra 10, 20, 50,000 a year, whatever it is mm -hmm. on vacations or to 
or the status of it. Yeah, the status of it. Have a nicer car, build a yeah. new bathroom, whatever it is. You know, it's it's it it, it 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 can be. And then you look at the compounding effect of that, and you think, well, gee, I'm just handing away a lot of money. But I think that the way for people to have the money conversation, and this is what's important, is is not to start the conversation out about money itself. Okay. Yeah. Because That's money smart. money has the energy force that brings up all the bad stuff right yeah yeah is to talk about who you are as people and what your purpose is your identity and and then the goals that you want to achieve from there and once you figure out then what's essential then you can start to have the money conversation okay and so if you go rather... about it in that order you can get there but if we start talking about okay well, we've got x dollars in the bank and you need to be earning Z dollars or you didn't do X. You're going to find all sorts of stuff is going to come up that you didn't want yeah. to come up, right? Mm -hmm. Because someone's then going to say, nitpick and say, well, gee, you know, you're buying the kids too many, too much of this, too much of that. They're getting spoiled. You know, they're at the wrong school. You, you start blaming somebody's parents for something. You know, all the negative shit. To be honest, I was trying not to use that word, but maybe it's got. No, it's okay. Because all you want here <laughs> um, uh, comes up. Whereas, if you can keep it to the human beings and who they are, and celebrate that in a way through their identity, through their talents, their X factor, mm -hmm. then the money part will naturally flow out, and it'll be easier conversation. Yeah, and something might just come up in that. Well, gee, I didn't know that's what you wanted to do or how you felt or that you didn't actually worry. You don't even see how much we're making as important beyond a certain level. Okay, now there's relief. Um, and I think that's where the money conversation, how the money conversations need to, need to go. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, talk about things that you enjoy doing. I think that's another side of this that we haven't quite touched on yet. But, you know, if you want people to change, say, change their spending habits, mm -hmm. maybe just find one area of their life that they could make a change in. You know, like I, for me, I made the change around my exercise, fitness, where I put my time for, for my wife and kids and let everything else get dealt with from there. It, not that we had a spending problem or anything like that, but I didn't make it about finances. Okay, I see, I see. So, so but again, it's the point being is, for that money conversation, talk about things that you enjoy doing that bring, you know, happiness, enjoyment, a fun, and then build build the conversation on that too. Yeah. Now, as a as a fellow business owner, I know that we often wear a lot of hats, and sometimes it can really take us away from our families, and it's really really tough. So, someone when I'm talking when I look to speak with someone who runs their own company, you've authored multiple books, you're you're very prolific in, in the environment that you're in. How do you find time to, to keep your health, to keep your family, to, to do all these things so that you're putting the most important things first rather than running the business? Because so many owners just get bogged down and, you know, my kids don't care about me. Like they care about the money, but they're not being able to take that wider perspective. So what do you do to take care of yourself, You? Yeah, well, that's a very, uh, very good question. So it takes a lot of focus to to do that. and so. I've got, if you want to call it a personal life energy like living plan, I've got, I, I've even written a booklet, not a published book, but a booklet about it that I give all my clients. But, you know, you've got to concentrate on when you get up in the morning, what are you going to do in the morning? Um, and, you know, we've all got a different circadian rhythm, if you want to call it that, and, and energy mm -hmm. force. So I'm more of a morning person. So I do create probably an hour and a half of quiet time before children appear, you know, at mm -hmm. 6.30 in the morning to go to school, get ready for, have breakfast and go to school at seven o'clock. I've already had an hour and a half of quiet time or done stuff. Um, then I've got some time I allow for exercise. So I've got, you know, I'm very big onto Peloton. I do all their, the bike riding and the, and, and the exercises, but I've got a, a plan for the week for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, okay, meetings come up, you've got to reschedule a little bit, but that's something that's really that's really important. Um, I think then looking at what food you eat, um, alcohol. So I've sort of almost I, I wouldn't say I'm a teetotaler, but I've almost eliminated it. Okay. Um, cool. 
He's like and, you. and it's interesting. Yeah, like more <laughs> and more, more and more people are doing that now. Um, Definitely. But then, in terms of the business, you know, it's important that you figure out what are the things that you're superb at doing. You know, your ten out of tens. And I've got probably I've got my ten out of tens. I've got quite a few eight out of tens just because of different skills. But they're the things I shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. Now it's clear the two out of tens you sort of know not to do. It's the eight out of tens that you've got to, as a business owner, you've got to delegate that um, and find other ways for it to get done. You know, with with your team and have very good communication. That's the that's the way around it. And, and you know, there's a formula there for all of us to to make that work. But you have got to be intentional about it. It doesn't come overnight. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a little bit of work, but you get a gain. The more you know yourself, you can work towards that plan. Yeah, I find for a lot of owners, it's very difficult to relinquish that control to delegate the tasks away from them, even though they may know intuitively that ultimately they can't do everything. It's just so hard for them to to give that away to somebody else and allow them to take it and run with it. But oftentimes, yeah. owners will find that it works even better if they are able to and, do and, that. And, yeah. you know, the hard thing is that you've got to accept these mistakes are going to get made. And Definitely. not everything's going to be done the way that you want. It's not easy to accept, but but if you're going to create a good working environment and a productive one at the end of the day that gives you a life, you've got to allow that to happen. Um, yes. And, you know, there's a little bit of trial and error, who you bring in and what's what position over time, all those things. And, but you've, but you've, ultimately got to do that you've got to be, and you've got to believe in the people that they can do it and and you've got to trust them and you've got to show that trust in the moment you don't show that trust then there will be a problem yeah yeah i'm just kind of curious so what do you find are some like key factors that hold people back when it comes to business and life and maybe they even their relationships together yeah i, I think that I, I think a lot of the a, a lot of it comes down to people don't think that they're good enough, um, mm. and then they're, and they're pro perhaps not worthy. Okay, that that would be that would be some of it, I think, um, or that there's someone else out there that's better than them at, at it, or this is going to be too much work, or, or I'm not like ready yet. Aspect I'll, I'll be ready later. Yeah. All of those things hold you back and i think you know there's a there's a very good book by a guy called dan sullivan from strategic coach mm -hmm. that says that talks about 10x is better than 2x and mm -hmm. you know i would encourage a lot of business owners to read that book because i think you can work on a path to 2x your business which is basically to double it mm -hmm. and you'll find that very painful and stressful right just to yeah. always be optimizing the same things that's actually quite hard work as Definitely. opposed to if you think, well, gee, what do I need to do if I was to 10 X my business? Now you've got to start peeling away all the, all, all, all the crappy things, the clients that perhaps aren't right for the business. You know, you, you, you design a new business model out of it yeah. and that breathes energy there. And I think, and I think that's also when you go through that path of thinking about it, that's when you start to think, okay, I'm going to need some different people potentially. I need their mindsets changed. You know, we 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 need to be thinking not 100 clients if you're a financial planner, but how do I have a business with a thousand of the right clients? Well, mm -hmm. okay, one person can't deal with a thousand clients. I'm going to need 10 other good planners in the business or, you know, you're selling consulting services or widgets or whatever it is. If you start thinking about your business differently, and reset the goals at a much higher level, that can then start to help you think, gee, I need, probably gonna need some different people in here too. Yeah, um, yeah. Different types of clients and it starts to get exciting. Definitely. Now, that's not for everybody. And some will say, I'm comfortable just to two weeks. Okay, that's fine. But, but I think that that's one avenue to, to go and do it. I'm more that type of person that's gonna think of things 10x exponential terms to mm -hmm. to realize my maximum potential. Mm -hmm. uh, but you've also, you know, if you're stuck in a place, you've got to you've got to break the circuit somewhere and do something that's pretty different. I think. Yeah, absolutely. 
especially when competing on such a wide field. I mean, basically a worldwide playing field. Yeah. You really got to differentiate yourself. Yeah. And huh. I think that's, you know, there's a, there's another good, so that, that book that I just mentioned is a good one. 10 X is better than two X. There's another one, a book I, I encourage people to read it's called play bigger. <laughs> that's just around what, what you just said, Dominic okay. is, is around the idea of what's your market niche? What, what, what little corner of the business market do you have that you own a hundred percent of the market of? Yeah. That's what yeah. you want to define. Definitely. Okay. You can be in the wealth management space, but you can find something to reposition your firm to be completely different to everybody else. Mm -hmm and scale it up from there. And I think that book's got some really good stories about how Uber did it. I mean, okay, that's a big brand, but you know, why not aspire to that? And, and, yeah. but it's more thinking about what, what market corner do you own and how do you brand yourself up and build yourself towards that? Beautiful. Definitely. Well, I know that uh, we've already gone over on time, so thank you so much. But before we go, we always we are a podcast dedicated towards financial independence and the pursuit of that. So the question we always ask all of our guests is, what is financial independence, financial freedom? What does it mean to, to you? Well, to me, it's about being able to do what I want, when I want, with who I want. That's exactly it. Autonomy of time, autonomy yes, of, of what yeah, you want. And, and, and I would say, you know, the reason I was an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur is that uh, I want autonomy over my time and it's having that time freedom. Yeah. And yeah, freedom's the big thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. It's not about the most amount of money. It's about having freedom and to be able to express your ideas and mm -hmm. to work with the people you want to work with. You know, you don't have to work with people that suck your energy. And money gives you, enough money gives you that choice. Now, uh, again, we don't need to all be billionaires to do that. You know? Yeah. But that's Absolutely. financial freedom, I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. And, you know, thank you so much for giving so much of yourself to our audience today, Hugh. And I'd like to give it, give the podcast to you. Is there anything that you're working on, anything that you'd like to shout out to let our audience know, maybe to learn more about DNA behavior or any new books you're writing, anything like that? Well, I, I firstly, I appreciate being on this podcast and for the uh, very insightful questions you both have asked. And you guys totally get what financial planning, wealth management should be, helping people screw their head on the right way to think about their life first. I, I, you know, I want to congratulate you for, for that. Uh, you know, I think if people want to learn more about, in a way, how I've done it, uh, you know, what we do in that space to contribute to this conversation, I've, I have re-released my financial DNA book that's there on Amazon. Um, and I think it's still free. It's in a 90-day window. You can go and get it for free. If you go and get it right now, or it's pretty cheap on Kindle, and and read that and see the story of, you know, how how you can, um, you know, bring that financial freedom into your life and manage your money and your life the right way, right? To build a quality life, and and Perfect. in that using, you know, the strengths out of your your own financial personality. So I, I, I would encourage people to go and do that right now um, as a first step. Certainly. And listeners, please, link will be down in the description for, for Hugh's book there. So we'll get, that, we'll get that set up for you. And then, Hugh, uh, before we close out, we always like to also ask, is there any questions that you have for us um, or anything that you would like to ask Dominic and myself? <laughs> well, I, you know, I'd, I'd like you guys to, you know, to ask you probably what, what you see your own identity is and what's the next stage for, for your life and businesses. Yeah, absolutely. You want to go first? Yeah, I'll take that. Okay. Uh, for me, my life has changed actually uh, quite a lot. I moved houses. I moved out of my family home and I'm now on my own and we have our podcast and I'm working on my business. And actually uh, it's funny that we talked a little bit about business and stuff. Cause I think next week's pod, we're going to talk about side hustles. It's one of the businesses I'm working on right now. And uh, no, I think for me, like my identity is that, like you talked about, the freedom of time, you know, the freedom on a Wednesday afternoon, I can have a great conversation with you and Chris and myself. It's just like, that's, that's what I live for. I love the moments where, hey, I want to, I want to talk about finance. I want to learn more. Let's talk about finance. Let's learn more. You know, that's, that's how what I love. Yeah. Uh, but what about you? I mean, 
Well, for me, Hugh, uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, when I started my own company, when we started the podcast, we started everything. I, I left a, a job that was making well, a lot of money. And when I left, everyone was like, Chris, you're so stupid. Like, you can't, you can't leave this job. Do you know who we are? Um, but I, I knew that there was something more for me. Growing up in my family, my father, he was a Marine. My mom was in the Army. And they had to work all the time to make ends meet. And I knew that that was a generational sin brought down from their parents and their parents. Yeah. So I always wanted to be sure that when I have kids, that I was never going to have to be a decision. I never wanted them to have to remember a day that dad wasn't there. So I have foregone business opportunities to grow my business exponentially with the knowledge that one day I will have kids and my wife and I are going to start that process here in the next few months of trying for children. So the next step for me is becoming a father, but more importantly, you know, setting the finances aside and really lifestyle planning to be there with them at all times. So then they have to never have to remember a day that their parents weren't there with them. Yeah. yeah well, I, and I think, you know, Chris, your, your journey is very similar to mine. I, I left a corporate career that I could have gone a lot further in being paid very well. And sometimes I sit here and I wonder, well, where would I be if I'd stayed in that? But mm -hmm. what I do know is I would never have been fulfilled. Yeah. Yeah. And, wow. and there's no price on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing I would tell our audience too is if you are at that crossroads and you or you are looking back in life and saying, what if, what if I had done this? Well, we only know the way that history did unfold. So once you make a decision, you go with that decision. You don't look back because there is no point in it. You know, you can learn from your decisions if you made a mistake, but going back and ruminating, if, if, I, if I made a different decision, could my life be in a better place? To your point, there, there is no energy that is going to be built, positive energy built that way. It's always going to yeah. just be negative. Yeah. Well, you guys are both very lucky, Dominic and Chris. You are miles ahead of most. Um, so I think this is fantastic, and I'm glad we've had this conversation today. And I'll look forward to putting it out amongst our, uh, you know, our our audience as well. When when you send me the links, and I, I and I think there's some people I'll, you know, want to show this because of other work we're doing. And so let's stay in touch. Absolutely. Thank you so we much. We might make some more quantum leaps together. There yeah, you go. There sounds good. <laughs> All right, Well, you thank you so much, and um, bye, guys. We'll see you around. Yeah, that's a pleasure. Thank you. All right, thank guys. You. Thank you. And with that, Hugh Massey has left the building. We'd like to thank him so much, and please look at the links below. We were going to have everything Hugh in the descriptions. What did you think of our podcast today, Dom? I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, he talked a little bit about like wanting to come back. I would love to have him come back. There was some stuff in there that I wanted to talk more about, yeah. like his mentorship program with Boys Without Father. I thought that was really interesting, and I would have loved to learn a little bit more about that. Yeah. Well, I say we talk all about everything that we talked about with Hugh today on this Five Friday Feedback. So I hope you guys enjoyed our conversation with Hugh today. If you like these types of interview styles, please let us know in the comments. Um, but until then, we'll see you on Five Friday Feedback. We'll be breaking down this conversation with you today. So later. Peace. This video podcast is sponsored by Mons on Wealth. The content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered financial advice. We do not endorse specific products or services. Past performance does not guarantee future results. The opinions expressed are those of the hosts and guests, not the podcast sponsor. It is crucial to consult with a qualified financial advisor or professional who can provide advice tailored to your specific needs before making any financial decisions, investments, or taking any other actions. If you are seeking specified help, you can reach out to Chris at monsonwealth.com.